Well, today we start and finish a series on Philemon. It follows on in your Bibles from Titus, um, but it doesn't really follow on from Titus. In fact, it's much more closely related to Colossians. Um, So let's pray and we'll get stuck into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you always for your word. Uh, We thank you for the teachings that you have in it for us. We thank you for how relevant it is to us um, thousands of years after it has been written. Heavenly Father, open our minds, clear our, clear our minds, soften our hearts, open our eyes to what you would have us say um, about you, uh, about you to others, and how you would live, have us live our lives uh, in modelling your Son. Amen. And there's a book in the New Testament that most of us have heard of because it's got a funny name. Now, I really don't care that much how it gets pronounced. It's Philemon or Philemon or Philemon, but that reminds me too much of a Philemon, so that doesn't help much. And, of course, there's Onesimus or Onesimus or just know the words. Don't worry about how they're pronounced. Um, But other than... Other than the fact that it's got a funny name, there's not much to it, is there? It's Paul's shortest letter and it doesn't contain any deep teachings like Romans or, or Galatians. And yet it is a very personal letter. And we get the privilege of listening in on a private conversation between Paul and his dear friend and brother in Christ, Philemon. Forgiveness is one of the key messages, a shining light, if you like, in the whole Bible, and especially the New Testament. And surely one of the brightest spots is this letter. Paul wrote the letter in the years around about 60 AD. But more important than the time is for us to know that Paul wrote this letter from prison. According to Acts uh, chapter 28, verse 16, Luke says, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And then in verse 30, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So he was under house arrest in a house that he rented free to receive visitors but not allowed to go anywhere. If he wasn't actually in chains, he might as well have been. And it was interesting last week to hear Rick talking about the names that appear at the end of many of the letters in the New Testament. In my reading for this sermon, I'd already discovered how important some of them were. And if we compare the end of Colossians and Philemon, we can see that Paul wrote them at the same time. And they were taken from Rome to Colossae by the same messengers, Tychicus and Anesimus. Yes, the same one that this letter is written about on a very touchy subject. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but as we learn more about this letter, I want you to remember that it is Anesimus who delivered this letter to Philemon. In verse 1, a prisoner of Christ Jesus As always, Paul did not consider himself a prisoner of Rome, a prisoner of circumstances or of the religious leaders who started his legal troubles. Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ for his gospel. And he wrote to Philemon, our beloved friend, a Christian brother living in Colossae. This is the only place in the New Testament where Philemon is mentioned by name, but we do know that he was a beloved friend of Paul. Paul's friendship with Philemon is shown by something significantly missing in his greeting in the letter. Of the 13 letters that Paul wrote to churches or individuals, nine of them, he calls himself an apostle in the opening verses. In this letter, along with Philippians and the letters to the Thessalonians, Paul appealed to his reader more as a friend and less as an apostle. And as well, it's to the beloved Apphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, 
Apphia was probably the wife of Philemon. And Archippus was possibly his son or at least a leader in the church that met in his house. And we read about him too uh, being commended uh, in Colossians. In this letter, Paul will appeal to Philemon regarding a runaway slave who has met Jesus and found refuge with Paul. In the customs of the time, Philemon's wife Apphia was the supervisor of the slaves in the household, so the letter possibly also concerned her. And to the church that meets in your house, this means that the church or a portion of the church in Colossae met in the house of Philemon. The earliest Christians had no property of their own for church buildings. The Jews had their synagogues, but Christians met in the homes of their members. The Christians of a city would be gathered into different house churches with a city bishop overseeing the different house churches. Up until the third century, there is no clear evidence of the existence of church buildings for the purpose of worship. All references point to private houses for this. In Rome, some, some of the oldest churches appear to have been built on the site of houses that were used for Christian worship. Now Philemon's good character has been reported to Paul across the sea in Rome. Now that's not much of a feat today, perhaps. With Facebook and the like, he would have known straight away. But it is a testament to Philemon that his love and faith and the way that he refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people had reached Paul with those 2,000-year-old communications. People who have love and faith towards the Lord Jesus will, or at least should, have love toward all his saints. And this letter is an acknowledgement of a faithful man who loves Jesus and loves Jesus' people. John tells us that this should certainly be typical and in fact it is the truest sign of one who has passed from death to life. In 1 John 3.14 he says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Paul had some very kind, generous words to say about Philemon. Well, what might Tim say about you if he was writing a letter to you or to one of your friends? Or he works hard or he's a good bloke or she has a nice house and a beautiful garden. But what about the way he loves people gives me great joy or the way she shares her home refreshes the heart of the Lord's people? What would Tim say about you? Now, before we go any further, we need to know something about slavery in the first century because it's key to the ideas in this letter. Although slavery was occasionally practiced in Israel, it was never widespread and was very carefully regulated by the Old Testament law. By contrast, the Roman Empire was built on slave labor. Every time the Romans conquered a new province, they added new slaves to their empire. In the ancient Roman world, almost everybody could become a slave, even Roman citizens. And 35 to 40% of the population were indeed enslaved. Many towns had more slaves than free people. It would not have been unusual for a rich man, which Philemon probably was, to own hundreds and even thousands of slaves. In short, slavery was so commonplace and so accepted that no one thought seriously to oppose it. And as the property of their masters, slaves were considered animated tools and could be bought and sold at their master's discretion. Slaves were often abused and they could be expelled from the master's house when they were too old or too sick to work. The most important for understanding the urgency of Paul's letter to Philemon is knowing that a master had the right by law to kill a slave when he or she ran away. So Paul is involved in a potential life or death matter. Yet Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon. Why? How could he do that? Didn't Paul know that slavery was wrong in the eyes of God? And if he knew that, why didn't he say so? 
These are questions that have troubled thoughtful Christians across the centuries. And it is a terrible tragedy that this letter was used by some in the 1700s to justify slavery. Paul didn't condemn it and didn't demand that Philemon release Onesimus, so it was said that he condoned slavery. On the other hand, nowhere does the New Testament provide theological support or justification for slavery. But what the secular humanists want us to forget is that it was Christians and the theology and the implications and the preaching of the gospel in places like Philemon that provided a spark that would be fanned into flame that eventually led to the abolition of this unjust institution, even though Paul didn't directly speak against it. Now, one man who would help that was help that was Granville Sharp. He was regarded as the grand old man of the abolition trade. Sorry, of the abolition struggle against the slave trade. And although a driving force in its early days, his place was later taken by others more familiar perhaps to you of Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect. But at one stage he was asked to help lawyers for a runaway slave who was in England uh, with his American master but had escaped. So he was probably quite familiar with Onesimus' situation. And he said, If we carefully examine the scriptures, we shall find that slavery and oppression were ever abominable in the sight of God. So Paul's task was not easy. He had to convince a man and an entire church that was immersed in the cultural acceptance of slavery to set aside that cultural viewpoint and to practice the Christian truth that all people are equal in Jesus when it comes to salvation. Colossians 3 verse 11 says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. But this would be like trying to convince a slave owner and a white church in an American South before the Civil War to accept a returning runaway slave as a member with full fellowship and benefits. Or for us to welcome someone who has done wrong, perhaps even wronged us, to welcome them into our church, into our home. Or to forgive a husband, a wife, a parent, a child, a sister or a brother who has said or done something to bring about grief and pain to us. Now, Paul could have asserted his apostolic authority. He does in plenty of other letters. But he wanted to secure Philemon's obedience from his heart. While not denying Onesimus' crime, Paul wanted Philemon, his wife, and the entire church to forgive him completely. He wanted mercy to triumph over raw justice. He also wanted to leave the door open for Philemon to free his slave so that perhaps Onesimus would choose to return to Rome and continue his ministry to Paul. While Paul's comments about Philemon are in the form of flattery, to then lay the case for Onesimus, they are undoubtedly true as well. Paul is confident that what he asks will be done, and perhaps more. But look at verse 9. I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Well, he's probably about 60, so perhaps old for the time, but knowing Paul, he's probably playing on words a bit here as well. The word for old here is the same word that he uses for leaders in a church, elders. And especially if we take the end of verse 19 that says not to mention that you owe me your very self, if we take that to mean that Philemon owes his salvation to Jesus but through the ministry of Paul, I've lost my place. Yes, he is an older man, but he is also an elder in the faith. And what about... Oh, by the way, I hope to be there soon, so prepare a room for me. He's subtle, isn't he? Or look at verse 8. I could be bold and order you to do what you know you should do, but I won't. 
He's confident in his request, but he is not taking any chances with the life of Onesimus. But Philemon must have thought Paul's arrest had done his head in when he got to verse 10. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. You what? This good-for-nothing, useless, thieving, runaway slave, and you call him with a term of endearment and kinship? But of course, Paul is referring to his leading of Onesimus to Jesus and becoming his father in the faith. He refers to Timothy and Titus in the same way. So immediately Philemon would have known that Onesimus has become a Christian. This good-for-nothing slave has been saved. And God always transforms those that he saves. Always. Everyone in this story is behaving very differently than they would have before meeting Jesus. These changes are not automatic or this letter wouldn't need to have been written. They require constant lifelong work. The letter is overflowing with Paul's gentleness, graciousness and sensitivity. In verses 4 to 7 he commends Philemon in a loving and gracious manner, describing how his own heart has come to have much joy and comfort in Philemon's love. He goes on to appeal to him as a brother in Christ, urging Philemon, If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. He gently adds, yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ as you have refreshed others. Now you may be thinking, well, of course, this is the Apostle Paul. What else do you expect? But don't forget what Paul was like before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. When the Jews stoned the innocent Stephen, Paul watched this gruesome spectacle in hearty agreement. Then he began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. He was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He describes himself during this time in the letter to Timothy as being a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Paul was not a nice man. To call him an angry young man wouldn't be an understatement. But here he is, yes, 30 years later, but a gentle, humble, gracious man urging others to love and kindness and forgiveness. And don't miss Paul's mention of Mark as one of his fellow workers in verse 24. You may remember on the first missionary journey, Mark had abandoned Paul and Barnabas. Later, when Barnabas wanted to give Mark a second chance, Paul adamantly refused, leading to a split between these two men of God. Barnabas took Mark and worked with him until Mark became a faithful man of God. As Paul grew in grace and gentleness, he forgave him and he came to see Mark as useful for service. Paul's change of heart towards Mark shows how God changed the apostle over the years as the fruit of the Spirit grew in his life. Now, Onesimus had not been a Christian as long as Paul, but there was already some major changes in his character. Formerly, he had grudgingly served Philemon, doing only the bare minimum and stealing as he looked for any opportunity to escape. But now, in submission to the Lord, he returns to his master, ready and willing to render whatever service is required of him. Formally, Paul says that Onesimus, whose name means useful, was useless to Philemon. He was not a good worker. In fact, he cost him money because he stole from him and ran away. But now he truly lives up to the meaning of his name, both to Paul and to Philemon. This can only mean that God had changed Onesimus' attitude before he resented his lot as a slave. He hated his master and he hated his master's God. But now he was in submission to God to the extent that he was willing to give up his freedom, go back and place himself under his master's authority. Instead of being a surly, angry slave, he now was a helpful, cheerful servant. God had changed Onesimus' attitude through the gospel. Well, has he changed your attitude? Teenagers, has God changed you from grumbling and snapping at your parents to cheerful compliance from the heart as you seek to please them? 
Husbands and wives, before you met Jesus, you were selfish and insensitive. Maybe you still are. Exploding in anger if the rest of the family don't do things your way. Or now you are patient and kind towards them. You think about their needs and seek to serve them. Or has God changed the way you act at work? Before you did the bare minimum to keep your job, grumbling with the other employees about the way their management treated you, now you excel with a joyful spirit of obedience, doing your job as if you were doing it for Jesus. So Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon. I still can't get my head around what it would be like to be Onesimus. I don't know whether he knew the contents of this letter, but I cannot imagine walking up to the house where the man can say, you're dead. But Onesimus had been so useful to Paul that he doesn't really want to let him go, but he knows that it is the right thing to do. Onesimus had done something wrong under the law in that he escaped from his master and probably stole from him as well. And it was time to set that right. So Paul was willing to send him back. Yet he obviously wanted Philemon to deal gently with Onesimus. Under Roman law, the slave owner had complete and total control over his slave. It wasn't unusual for slaves to be crucified for much less offences than escaping. In verse 12, Paul is saying, Philemon, I know this man has done you wrong and he deserves to be punished, but consider him as my own heart, my inmost being, a part of me and be merciful to him. I would have liked to keep him with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. Clearly, Paul wanted Onesimus to stay because he had become a big help to him. Paul sweetened his appeal in three ways. First, if Onesimus stayed, he could serve Paul on your behalf, Philemon. If you leave Onesimus with me, it's like you serving me because Onesimus is your rightful servant. And if Onesimus stayed, he helped a man in chains. Philemon, I know Onesimus might be of some use to you now, yet I am in chains and need all the help I can get. And thirdly, if Onesimus stayed, he not only helped a man in chains, but he helped a man in chains for the gospel. Don't forget why I am here in chains. Remember that it is for the sake of the gospel. But without your permission, Philemon, I don't want to do anything. Paul made his appeal and he made it strongly and skillfully. At the same time, he really did leave the decision to Philemon. He would appeal in love, but he would not trample over the rights of Philemon under the law. This explained why Paul would not force a decision on Philemon. If he demanded it as he could, then Philemon's good deed would come by compulsion and not be voluntary. This would make the whole affair unpleasant and rob Philemon of any reward, either earthly or eternally, that he otherwise might have had. Well, what did Philemon do? Well, of course, we don't know from the Bible. Uh, But Ignatius, writing some 50 years later to the church in Ephesus, spoke uh, very highly and commended their bishop, whose name was Onesimus. Now, of course, we don't know that it's the same Onesimus, but I think it's pretty safe to go with that. We come now to verses 17 to 19, and the most important part, I think, of this letter. This is the gospel according to Philemon, or at least to Philemon from Paul. When I first looked at this book, this letter, I thought I might have been taking it a bit far, drawing perhaps too long a bow. But then I read Martin Luther had something similar to say, so I thought, well, that's good enough for me. Verse 17, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If Onesimus had turned up at Philemon's door without the meditation that this letter provides, then he would have been as good as dead. As a Christian, Philemon may have been merciful, but it probably wouldn't have gone well with him nonetheless. And if we turn up at God's house 
And I don't mean a church building. If we turn up at God's house without a mediator in Jesus, then we are dead eternally. As our rebellion against a holy God is far, far worse than Onesimus' earthly rebellion. In verse 18, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Paul takes the pen or whatever he wrote with from the scribe and writes an IOU to Philemon. Now, I want to suggest that this relationship between Onesimus and Philemon and Paul may be likened to the relationship that you and I have to God the Father and to Jesus Christ in the gospel. So let's think of Paul as being the mediator, like Jesus. And let's think of Philemon, for Paul is making the appeal to him because of the requirements that Philemon has for the obedience of his slaves under the law. So let's think of Philemon like God the Father. And incidentally, Philemon's name means the loving one. Then when we look at Onesimus, how can we not think of ourselves? Because Onesimus illustrates you and me in at least four ways. First, as far as we know, he was born a slave. And we too are born in slavery to sin under guilt and condemnation as a result of Adam's sin. Secondly, we have become lawbreakers, just as Onesimus had become when he ran away and stole from his master. We have, in specific acts of rebellion against God, become lawbreakers. Third, we are, just as Onesimus, unable to pay our debts. We cannot pay our debts to God, for we are sinners and our debt is infinite. And we cannot pay an infinite debt. The repayments go on forever. And fourth, Onesimus is destined for death, just as our sin means that we are destined for death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Luther understood that here we have something that is at least an illustration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, This epistle shows a right, noble, lovely example of Christian love. Here we see how St. Paul lays himself out for poor Onesimus and with all his means pleads his cause with his master and so speaks himself as if he were Onesimus and had himself done wrong to Philemon. Yet this he does not with force nor constraint as if he had full right no, he puts himself out of his rights, whereby he constrains Philemon to see that he must also strip himself of his rights. Now, these are the most important words. Even as Christ did for us with God the Father, so also does Paul do for Onesimus with Philemon. For Christ also put himself out of his rights and with love and humbleness, has prevailed with his father that he should lay aside his wrath and his rights and receive us in grace for Christ's sake. And so earnestly intercedes for us and lays himself out so tenderly for us on the cross. And then these words, which apparently Martin Luther liked to quote often, for we are all God's anesimi, if we believe it. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that as we read these verses, we can't help but think of the good news of Jesus. Substitutionary atonement. Yes, yes, I know we're not supposed to use jargon and those big words are hard to get, but I'm unapologetic. I love them. Even more than the words, I love the concept that they bring. Think of atonement like this. At one moment, at one moment. A harmonious relationship with a holy God. We don't have one and we can't make it happen ourselves. So God provided a substitute. Jesus took our place to pay what we owe. He says to his father, welcome this one as if he were me. 
And if he has done you wrong or owes you anything, no matter how bad it is or how much I, how much he owes, I have paid it. It is finished. To finish off, just a few comments about these closing greetings. Epaphras, now there in chains with Paul in Rome, was, according to Colossians 1 verse 6, the one who brought the gospel to Colossae years before. It says, since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. With Paul in Rome, though not in prison it seems, are Mark and Luke. So there you have about two -third, the authors of about two-thirds of the New Testament together in Rome. And the forgiven and reconciled Mark, who was now a great servant of Paul. And a warning from the name Demas. Though held in high enough esteem to be mentioned in the same breath in this letter as Luke and Mark, in just a couple of years, Demas has fallen in love with this world and has deserted Paul, leaving him at his lowest point shortly before his execution in Rome. Don't take your salvation for granted. If you are saved, then your salvation is secure. But don't take it for granted. Work it out with fear and trembling, with Bible reading and prayer, lest you turn away from such a great salvation like Demas did. Well, I hope you can now see that this short letter is a diamond mine of Christian truth and that it thoroughly deserves its place in the New Testament. Read it again this week. It doesn't take long. And then read it again. Because it reminds us that the gospel has the power to reconcile all kinds of people to God and to each other. That Christianity has the power to heal hurting hearts and to repair broken people, putting them back on their feet. It instructs us that when given the chance, we are to participate in the revolutionary, countercultural thing called grace and forgiveness. That forgiveness which always leads to reconciliation. Has God opened your eyes to see that you are just as needy of the Saviour as Onesimus, that runaway thief and slave? Have you trusted in Christ's shed blood to pay the debt that you rightfully owe? If you have trusted in Christ, are you allowing his grace to change you? Is your character becoming less angry and more patient, kind, gentle and loving? Is your attitude toward authority becoming more submissive, even if you are treated wrongly? Is your life changing from self-centered uselessness and unprofitability to becoming a useful and profitable servant? to others as you serve Jesus. And what about your relationships? Are you working at being reconciled to those from whom you are alienated as much as it depends on you? Have you sought forgiveness and made restitution to those that you have wronged? Let's pray. Uh, Almighty and holy God, our loving and merciful Father. Thank you for Paul's letter to Philemon. Thank you for Philemon, a loving man who was known throughout the world for the way he treated your people. Might we follow his example as he follows Paul, as he follows Christ. Heavenly Father, help us to be forgiving. Help us to put aside our grudges. Help us to be reconciled to you, to each other. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have made that possible. Most of all, that you have reconciled us to yourself by forgiving us 
while we were still sinners. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Amen.